So uh, my disclaimer is I'm not a gastroenterologist. Um, I don't really know that much about faecal incontinence, but we see an awful lot of it. And so I just thought someone's got to do the talk, so I've decided to do it myself. So what is faecal incontinence? It's loss of stools, solid or liquid, from the bowel in inappropriate places at undesirable times after a typical time of toilet training, so usually in children who are four years or older. Um, other terms that are used for this is soiling or encapresis. The Paris Consensus on Childhood Constipation Terminology Group um, suggests that we should use the word faecal incontinence rather than soiling and encapresis because sometimes they are associated with other things. Um, and faecal incontinence can be organic or functional, can be involuntary or voluntary. So epidemiology, faecal incontinence occurs in about 2.8% of four-year-olds and about 1.5% of kids really from seven to 11 when you look at those numbers. It's four times more common in boys and it usually occurs during the day and the best, most common time is after school. And when it uh, occurs in sleep, it's usually related to overflow. So what are the organic causes? For, for many of you, you already know these. Organic causes include Hirschsprung's disease, malabsorption syndrome, hypothyroidism, hypercalcemia, diabetes insipidus or neurological conditions. But functional causes are what we're going to talk a little bit more about because that's what I see most commonly. And functional causes are broken into either constipation-associated faecal incontinence, which is by far the majority, like 80%, and the non-retentive faecal incontinence, which are not associated with constipation in the 20%. So another way of thinking about the constipation-associated group is to think about kids with chronic constipation. And in fact, 50 to 70% of children who have chronic constipation also have faecal incontinence. So you can see constipation and faecal incontinence are quite closely linked, but not always. And it manifests as overflow soiling or staining on their underpants. In the non-retentive group, um, some people call this group the encapresis group, although that term, as I said, is bad um, because it's confusing. Um, and the non-retentive faecal incontinence, so not associated with, con with, um, with constipation, is often associated with psychological stress or with poor toilet training. So what are the risks for functional constipation and faecal incontinence? So firstly, the times when it's most likely to occur, it tends to occur in, in bubs at the introduction of solids, at the introduction of toilet training and at the start of school. So times of stress um, seems to be when it can commonly occur. Um, for it, when there's psychological or psychosocial stresses, particularly for the non-retentive faecal incontinent groups. So this, you know, family separation or a child's going through some psychological problem. Inadequate toilet training. Sometimes when we go back in the history, you find out the time of toilet training is at a time of the birth of sibling or something like that, so they didn't really have focus when their parents are trying to toilet train them. Painful defecation, or stool withholding and the vicious cycle, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Diet, so poor diets, low fibre diet can uh, cause constipation. Poor fluid intake, which affects um, the yeah, consistency of the stools. Lack of exercise. Um, Slow colonic transit, which is an interesting one, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, John Hudson in Melbourne, a, a surgeon, has done a bit of work in this field. Cow's milk protein allergy, we all hear about that in training in paediatrics. I really don't see it that often, but it's something that can sometimes occur. And functional constipation is associated with things like um, ADHD, autistic spectrum disorder, anxiety, depression, and other psychological conditions in children. So um, and this is really that, how, how does chronic constipation result in faecal incontinence? So it's usually this vicious cycle of the kids past a hard stool, it hurt. They then decide they don't like doing poo, so they voluntarily withhold stooling, and as a result, they get some rectal dilation, may even result in megacolon. And after they do this for a while where they sort of withhold stooling and they get chronic dilation, the nerve habi habituates and they then end up with an impaired rectal sensation and motor function. So they actually don't feel they need to poo at the normal sort of rectal fullness time and when they defecate, they have poorer pressures. Um, this results in leakage of soft stools during spontaneous relaxations of the sphincter 
precipitated by rectal distension. So um, the gastrocolic reflex, when you eat, your, um, your um, sphincter relaxes and uh, your, your rectum distends and often they might leak at those times. It's very confusing for parents because what they'll see is soft stools and so they don't think they're constipated. Um, and so you, you just got to pick the obstipation with overflow from, from the true diarrhoea kids. And often the child is unaware of this and they're not aware that they've got poo in their pants. And they often get in trouble from parents who say, of course you can smell that poo and the kid's just not aware it's happening. Um, so they eventually then pass this large hard stool and often parents will say it's a big poo, it doesn't flush, that's a classic, it's actually part of the rumps, the scoring, um, and that's often a sign. And, and it perpetuates this vicious cycle and you can just see how it gets worse and worse. So I love the Bristol stool chart, I wear it around my neck. Um, type 7's running out because my finger holds that spot. So um, what are the symptoms of chronic constipation? Abdominal pain or discomfort. Um, it's associated with daytime urinary incontinence and nocturnal enuresis. So a third of kids with um, constipation actually have wetting. Um, associated with urinary tract infections, particularly in girls. And um, there are various ways of diagnosing um, chronic constipation. The two that's commonly used are Rome 3 or PACT. And they're very similar, and this is the Rome 3 score. So the Rome 3 criteria for functional constipation in children is in a child who's developmentally aged between 4 to 18 years, having at least two of the following for at least two months. So passing, um, defecating two or less times per week, having at least one episode of faecal incontinence per week, having a history of retentive posturing or excessive volitional stool retention, a history of uh, painful or hard bowel motions, the presence of a large faecal mass in the rectum on PR, if you were to do that, but I don't recommend we do that, and a history of large diameter stools that may obstruct the toilet, which is the one I've said before. So actually it's really common. And um, often we conducted a study, oh, probably over 10 years ago now, published in Journal Paediatrics and Child Health, where we actually asked parents do you think your con kid's constipated? And we actually then assess them using a Rome 3 score. And most parents, particularly if their child defecated most days, are not aware that their child has constipation. And so they, they associate the word constipation sometimes with, you know, this guilt thing, I've done something wrong. So it's just kind of explaining to them that it may impact on the child's bladder function and it's, you know, it might need to be addressed. So what investigations do we normally do? A bowel chart or diary is very helpful. Um, a lot of people do abdominal x-rays and abdominal x-rays are helpful because you can see the faecal mass. You can't kind of tell how much, but you can just see all this poo on the x-ray. But what's it probably more useful is that you can assess the lower spine and exclude um, spina bifida or a coulter or something like that. But what I commonly do and what's increasingly recommended by the ICCS is abdominal ultrasound for a rectal diameter. So th there is a standardised position of where to do this, so it's just not any measurement. Um, some people don't do it properly, but so there are standardised methods. But I suppose even if you go to someone who doesn't do it at, at exactly the right spot, if they consistently do it, you can use it to measure progress. So this, the um, recommendation is there's an age sort of thing, but basically a rectal distension beyond three centimetres is a sign of chronic constipation with megarectum. However, there's been a recent study just this year that showed that if you just defecate it, that won't be distended necessarily. So non-distension does not exclude chronic constipation, especially if they've defecated within a couple of hours, but a distension beyond three centimetres is very helpful um, for you and also to show the parents. So anal rectal manometry is sometimes done mainly in Melbourne. We don't do it here. Colonic transit study is something I'm increasingly doing in the really complex kids and it's quite helpful. So it's an, a nuclear medicine study and basically it looks at the colonic transit time and detects kids who've got slow transit constipation. And if they have slow transit constipation, it differentiates them whether they're slow all the way or they're, they're normal to the end and then they're sluggish right at the end. Um, blood tests are of limited value, but you can detect, for example, hypothyroidism, celiac disease, lead poisoning and hypercalcemia. 
And this is just a lovely ultrasound to show you what it looks like. And we have on an ultrasound in our clinic and we show parents this and, and they find it quite helpful. So when you say, look, see, this is the rectum. It's pushing into the bladder and it makes the bladder not work very well. When they visually see that, they can understand what you mean. So the, the rectal distension, the measurement is across here and it should be less than three centimetres. Actually 2.5, but like if it's less than three, it really is a problem. So what is the aim of treatment? So the aim of treatment is firstly to reduce pain and reduce retentive behaviour because the kids don't poo because it hurts. And so if you can reduce the pain in the first instance, that just helps them be on side with you. Um, so my first aim is not to reduce the soiling. It's actually to reduce pain. The soiling comes second. Um, we talk about diets and laxatives to soften stool and empty the intestine. And then the second aim is to lower their level of distress and develop a normal bowel habit using behavioural strategies such as toilet training, incentives and rewards, desensitisation of toilet phobia and environmental management. So cognitive therapy is sometimes useful, like psychotherapy, cognitive and family therapy, particularly for the children with psychological problems. And so in terms of incontinence, we see a lot more psychopathology in the people with faecal incontinence compared with the people with urinary incontinence. And, um, and uh, it's a known fact, and, and um, I'm actually not sure why this happens, but certainly um, some of these kids need psychological management and educational strategies. So what are the treatments? This is our bowel program. Making sure they drink well, making sure that they have laxatives. Now, taste is really important for kids. For me, that's probably the most important thing. If the kids won't like it, they won't take it. And it doesn't matter if you have the best laxative in the world, if they don't take it, it's no good. Um, so we talk about taste and we go for taste tests and we ask them to come back and let me know what they think and can they think of a nice way to make it go down. I never hide it from them because they're, they're smarter than you and they'll always be able to detect it. So it's just how can you, how can you encourage that? And with the laxatives, there's basically two phases. There's a disempowered action phase and then there's a maintenance phase which I'll talk a little bit about later. Correct toilet height and posture is very important. So this picture of this little girl hanging up there, you can imagine when she does poos, she's actually going to struggle with trying to push all of the poo out. So having um, adequate foot support would be really helpful. Um, understanding the regular toilet sits, uh, uh, understanding and putting in regular toilet sits with the gastrocolic reflex. I think the kids tend to soil um, often in the afternoons because probably they've got two um, gastrocolic reflex actions going on at recess and lunch when they eat and they come home from school and they're ravenously hungry, they have something to eat and then that's when they soil. So just kind of recognising that and making sure you time that right is important. Looking at their diet obviously is in important. Transcutaneous interferential therapy, I hope Gail might just possibly mention on that. So this is um, John Hudson's work in, in uh, Melbourne. So he's looked at neuromodulation using a different way of doing it called transcutaneous interferential therapy. And he's found that it really helps children with slow transit constipation actually increase the transit time. I use stimulants as the other way as well. And that would, so if you've got a kid who's got slow transit, um, usually stimulants are quicker. Um, so stimulants, and if that doesn't work, I try transcutaneous um, interferential. And biofeedback, there's been a Cochrane systematic review saying it, it has very limited value, i.e. it doesn't work. So I don't do that. <clears throat> so choice of laxatives. Well, you need to break the laxatives down into what they do. So stool softeners, um, such as uh, lip lubricants, such as liquid paraffin, surface wetting agents um, are helpful. Stimulants, such as Senna, um, is helpful. Osmotic laxatives are probably the most helpful. So osmotic laxatives such as lactulose and then the macroglycols. Bulking agents for kids who have terrible diets and the potent stimulants are really only used in hospitals. So according to um, the 2012 Cochrane Systematic Review, the, the best laxative for treating chronic constipation is actually the macroglycols. Um, so it's superior to placebo, lactulose, milk and magnesia for increasing the frequency of motions in childhood constipation and less side effects. So to me, that's a winner. So what are they? They are the Muvicol and Osmolax. And to me, the, the taste issue is really important. So as some of you know, um, Muvicol comes in flavourless, which is like salt, um, lemon, chocolate and 
They're not very nice, but some kids like them. Um, Osmax comes flavourless, which is really flavourless. And, and the movie coal comes in satchels, whereas Osmax comes in a tub, which means that titrating doses can be a little bit tricky. Just, uh, yeah, but even so, some kids won't have it. Uh, so just being aware of taste, I think, is really important in talking to your kids about that. So this is a paper by um, Tony Cato, published in Medical Journal of Australia in 2005, and it's a nice little algorithm for treating constipation. So symptoms suggest faecal retention. Yes, symptoms are a sign of primary disorder, like Hirschsprung's disease or anal atresia. Yes, go and treat that first. No, diagnose fun functional constipation and soiling. Explain and educate the parents and child. Is there a significant impaction? Yes. Disimpact. Then do maintenance therapy with behavioural modification laxatives. Regular follow-up for at least six months. And we emphasise the at least six months. Commonly, parents will put them on a bowel program. It works. The kid, the kid gets better. They stop after one or two months. And then they get it back again because they haven't actually reduce their rectal distension. I normally say to mums, you know, when you were pregnant and you gave birth to your baby the day after the baby's born, you're still a little bit flabby. It takes six months to, inc to increase your muscle tone to get back to normal. That's what your bowel's like on the inside um, to un explain the, the need for that maintenance therapy for that period of time. Then wean from laxatives after six months um, and if there's a relapse, you need to go through the loop again. So I found this a really useful resource. I found this when I was working in Newcastle as a registrar about 30 years ago. It's now no longer published, but it's free online, which is even better. So it's called Beating Sneaky Poos for no one, people who might not be aware of it. You can download it and print it. It's a book, and then there's a kids' colouring in-book version that goes with it. Basically what it is, it's in simple language with lots of cute pictures about um, – Sneaky poo being the problem and mum and you being on side against it. So instead of the parent and the child fighting each other about going to the toilet and stuff, mum and the kids on side and ex externalises the problem and basically says the problem is not you, the problem is poo and we're going to get be we're going to beat it. So it's a really nice resource and I, I quite like it and use it quite often. Okay, how many minutes have I got left? Thank you very much. How do you decide if an anus is anterior? How do I decide if an anus is anterior? Slightly, and yes. And I guess the question is, so what? I. Annie's going to take it. Okay. Um, it's a very good question. Very good question. Three ways you can do it. Um, for girls. The anus should be in the middle, midpoint of the tip of the coccyx and the posterior limit of the introitus. For the boys, it should be on the line joining the two ischial tuberosities, but none of this is useful. Anyhow, um, there is another, there's some very good literature recently uh, which talks about anogenital distance, and I encourage you to read that. There are some nomograms in it. You have to, mind, you have to be mindful that making the diagnosis of an anterior anus is like labeling somebody with a resistant bacteria and then you never take the label off. Because, the reason I say this is because the, anal, the distance between the anus and the introitus in a girl, especially in a girl, will change through puberty as the perineal body develops. So calling something anterior anus for life um, is, a tr is tricky business when you're seeing the child at two or three years of age. Does that answer that question? More importantly, you have to look at the consequences of what you think is anterior anus. Is that a cl significant clinical problem? And if it is, then um, pro probably an examination under anesthetic is a good idea to confirm that if it is a significant clinical problem. But it is a very difficult diagnosis to make in majority of the cases, and it's a very good question. <laughs> 